PDE boundary conditions that eliminate quantum weirdness. In this video, we will present a mathematical game focused on boundary conditions. Unlike any discussion you ever heard before, what you probably heard before is something like this, that a partial differential equation psi is defined over a domain omega, and the boundary condition is that psi equals zero everywhere on that boundary, and that determines the final solution to that differential equation. But you never heard anything like what I'm about to say. On domain omega in one dimension, we define a partial differential wave equation point alpha on the boundary of omega is the location of an intricate and complicated boundary condition which specifies how two waves going in opposite directions, psi l and psi r, are interconnected. Our clever model is so designed that you can solve the boundary condition for a single point alpha if and only if you also solve the problem of weirdness everywhere in the quantum world. You may be intimidated by quantum weirdness, but surely you're not intimidated by a single point alpha. What I just said sounds like some kind of foreign language, so what is up? I'm going to adopt the language and technology of PDE boundary conditions and use that technology to build a mathematical machine or game designed to solve an entirely different problem, namely the problem of defining and eliminating quantum weirdness. Kurt Gödel and Alan Turing built such mathematical machines or games in the 1930s to demonstrate that axiomatization of all of mathematics was impossible. Gödel wrote about the undecidability of logical mathematical statements, and Turing designed the Turing machine to show that there was no solution to the halting problem. In other words, those guys designed simple mathematical machines or games that changed the course of mathematics. Our approach in this video differs from those guys in two ways. In the first place, they took themselves very seriously, whereas we're just building a game which we don't think anyone should take seriously. And in the second place, they were focused on axiomatization and getting rid of it, whereas we're focused on quantum weirdness and getting rid of it within the fanciful context of a game. Godel and Turing inspired us in the sense of showing us that one can use a well-known mathematical technology and adapt it to building a game or machine to attack a different problem than one would normally attack with that approach. I'm not just speaking about the Schrodinger cat, but of all the insoluble problems that plague quantum mechanics, such as the answer to the question why particles behave differently if, they are, if we are looking at them than they do if we close our eyes. Quantum mathematics, which is the most accurate and productive science that humans have ever had, is the source of our entire high-tech economy, including the computers, internet, and video cameras through which I'm speaking to you, has a chronic disease called weirdness, which means that there's something fishy about it, which means that in the 1920s, some kind of mistake was made in the starting assumptions, an unknown mistake, which even Einstein could not figure out, that has afflicted quantum mechanics as a chronic illness ever since, and everyone knows it. The purpose of the boundary condition game we're going to build is to vaccinate you against quantum weirdness. The ideas in this video have already been published in a scholarly peer-reviewed mathematics journal article, and at the end of this video I will, will tell you how to immediately grab that article, either to download it into your computer or to read it online. I will give you the DOI. With this DOI, you can obtain this article free of charge immediately as soon as you want. So here's a fun puzzle for you to solve. Richard Feynman said that quantum particles behave differently if we're watching them than if we close our eyes. Feynman said that he had no idea why. 
just as he had no idea why the double slit experiment works. But just think about it. If Feynman's right that particles behave differently when we are watching them, that means that some sort of a signal is going out from your eye and the quantum particle is responding to that signal. Since your eyes don't have superpowers, that means that a zero energy signal must be emanating from your eyes. Now, I know that many people say there's no such thing as zero energy waves, and I'm going to show you uh, shortly that this idea of zero energy waves being impossible is wrong. I will hopefully convince you of that. So let's write the simplest possible complex wave equation in one dimension. This blue arrow represents a plane wave, psi L, going out from your eye. And when it hits the quantum particle alpha, it reflects. Now it's a plane wave going towards your eye, as psi R, and as it reflected, as it made a U-turn, it turned from a plane wave into a Schrodinger wave and either carried particle alpha or a photon gamma away from alpha, some of the energy from particle alpha, back into your eye. So this model that I just described is the game or simple machine that we are developing in this video. If what you want is common garden variety boundary condition problems, then you're watching the wrong video. Look at it this way. With a normal boundary condition problem, you're trying to catch a fish like this. But here is the kind of fish that Kurt Godel and Alan Turing caught by using a specially designed net. The fish that they caught was called axiomatization. What we're trying to do is to use the technology of boundary condition problems to catch a different fish than Turing and Godel caught. Ours is the ancient fish of quantum weirdness. We define one-dimensional domain omega to go from alpha to your eye. The well-known wave equation is defined over that domain. Here is a simpler way to write the same partial differential equation. It is easy to show that u equals e to the i kx plus or minus omega t is a solution. We will use both solutions. If the plus minus is plus, then the wave is traveling to the left. If it's minus, then it's traveling to the right. So we've seen the partial differential equation and its solution defined over domain omega, but our primary interest is not on the differential equation, but rather on the boundary condition. And the specific boundary condition we're focusing on is that at point alpha, which is where particle alpha is sitting. That boundary condition shows an intricate and complicated relationship between the two solutions, psi L and psi R. As I said before, psi L reflects on particle alpha, and as it reverses direction, it becomes a Schrodinger wave and carries off a particle, either alpha or gamma, back to the eye. So that is our intricate boundary condition. Now, how could a single point alpha be so important? Because it teaches you, if you understand it, that nature is organized differently than most people think, and it is most people's misconception of how nature is organized that is the, is the reason for quantum weirdness. The model we're building is slightly more complicated because particle alpha can present itself to a wave either as transparent or reflective. It makes this decision at random. If it is reflective, then, it, then the incoming psi L is reflected back as an outgoing psi R, as we've said. But on the other hand, at random, the particle can present itself as transparent, which is what it does most of the time, and therefore a incoming wave from the right can pass straight through without ever meeting a particle and go off into the vacuum. That kind of a wave, which is not interacting with any particle, is what we call a ghost wave, because 
uh, our, our detectors can only see particles, they can't see waves. And if a wave is not attached to any particle, then we know about it only from inference. We can't see it. A particle will only reflect a wave that has a wavelength which equals the de Broglie wavelength of the particle. These waves we have been talking about are called elementary waves, especially the top one, the blue wave going from the detector to particle alpha, is called an elementary wave. We need to say something about the limits of our game, which focuses only on free and not bound particles. Thus, the periodic table, chemistry, atoms, molecules, biochemistry, and harmonic oscillators are not part of this game. Furthermore, our game is limited to one dimension with only one particle, and that particle has no spin, no electromagnetism, and it is not a wave packet. We draw a distinction between the particles and the wave packets. Many people say that every wave must carry energy, but I say they're wrong. As these people go on to say that waves can be defined by how they handle energy. But I say that is not true of the zero energy waves that grow and live in the quantum world. For example, take the Schrodinger wave. It is a zero energy wave. It carries probability amplitudes. It may convey a Hamiltonian operator, or it may convey a, part, a um, momentum operator, but it conveys no raw energy. A Schrodinger wave cannot push or pull a particle. It can do no work. It describes how nature is likely to behave, but it doesn't thrust particles of nature in that direction. Like the Schrodinger wave equation, like the Klein-Gordon wave equation, our elementary waves are going to carry no energy. Even if you still disagree, you could enjoy this game as an unrealistic but fun game. Now you may ask, how can a zero energy wave accomplish anything? Well, I'm going to tell you a story. The story is about the Purcell effect, and the point of this story is to show you that zero energy elementary waves are in control uh, of how things happen, even though they have zero energy. You can take a Rydberg atom, such as sodium, cesium, magnesium, or calcium, and heat it in an oven, and then use a laser to excite the outer electron to a higher energy state, and then inject the atom into a micro cavity. So the outer electron will drop to a lower energy level and emit a photon 500 times faster if the mode of the cavity or the available states are resonant than if they're not. Now what does it mean to be resonant? Resonant means that the diameter of the cavity is a multiple of lambda over 2 where lambda is the wavelength of the photon that would be emitted. So how does a hot and excited Rydberg atom wandering naively into a cavity know the width of the cavity? Does a quantum wave from inside the atom go out and measure the environment? And if it is inhospitable, go back into the atom and tell the electron, forget it, stay where you are. Of course not. Rather, the mode of the cavity is something of zero energy that already lives inside the cavity before any excited Rydberg atom arrives. We are going to rename the mode of the cavity and call it a elementary wave, a zero energy elementary wave that lives inside that cavity. So what these waves do is trigger the electron uh, to use the store energy stored up inside the electron. So the elementary wave uh, gives permission or triggers the electron to use its own ener energy to fall to a lower energy state. And that shows how a zero energy elementary wave can be in control 
despite the fact that it has no energy. So far we have introduced a PDE boundary condition game or machine for the purpose of catching this extraordinary fish. A quantum weirdness. There are two ways to think about this game. One, you could say, well, it's interesting fiction. It's just a game. It has powerful uses, but it's just a fiction. The alternative viewpoint, which is mine, is that this game actually corresponds to reality, to nature. Uh, I have been spending 10 years reviewing the published experiments from quantum mechanics, and I'm convinced that there's a mountain, or at least a very large hill, of uh, experiments which demonstrate that zero energy elementary waves do emanate from, come out of detectors, and that particles, quantum particles, follow those waves backwards. So the game or machine that I'm introducing you to is more interesting if it's realistic after all. So let's look at one, just one of these experiments. Uh, this is a experiment that was published in 1992 in Physical Review A by Kaiser Clothier Werner et al. It's a neutron interferometer experiment by people who were the founding fathers that laid the foundations of the science of neutron interferometry. So they had a neutron source, which happened to be a nuclear reactor up in the upper left, and the neutrons uh, came down and entered the red uh, square, which is a neutron interferometer. It has in it four black blades sticking up vertically, and the neutrons and, uh, bounce off and uh, move through those blades. Their neutron stream is divided into two streams, psi one on the bottom, psi two on the top, and then the, the two streams join together and exit the uh, interferometer, uh, exit beam called C3 directly into a detector. Now, just where the two beams uh, bifurcate, there's an oscillating aluminum plate which has the effect of inducing a phase shift, a, a sinusoidal phase shift of one beam vis-a-vis -vis the other, so that when the two beams do rejoin and go down to the detector, what the detector sees is a sinusoidal uh, wave, which is indicating um, wave interference. Now, bismuth is a metal, the 83rd, 83rd element, which slows down neutrons and neutron uh, waves. They put a sample, they put no sample or a 5 millimeter sample or 10 millimeter sample, or up to 20 millimeter sample of bismuth into the upper beam, but not the lower beam. As they put in more and more bismuth, the upper beam uh, wave packet was slowed down so that it did not overlap so well the lower beam wave packet when they rejoined. So what the detector saw with an increasing sample of bismuth was a diminishing amount of height of the sine wave. And when they got to 12 millimeters or more of bismuth, there was no wave interference whatsoever. Now, you'd say, well, that's interesting, but it's kind of routine. Well, then they repeated exactly the same experiment that I just described, with one tiny exception, that they had a nearly perfect uh, sample of an analyzer crystal of silicon that they put into the exit beam after the neutrons have left the interferometer, but before they got to the detector. What the analyzer crystal does is it focuses the beam, it increases the height of the uh, Gaussian in the center and uh, decreases the spread of wavelengths of neutrons. So you'd think, okay, it focuses the beam, so that should increase the penetration of the beam of neutrons into the detector, but have no effect on the interference that had been going on upstream inside the interferometer, right? Wrong. It turned out to their astonishment that when they put that analyzer crystal, uh, where I've shown it here, outside downstream from the interferometer, it restored robust 
uh, interference, tall wave, uh, tall waves, tall sine waves, uh, throughout the data set, no matter how much bismuth they used, even a full sample of 20 millimeters of bismuth, they had huge sine waves. And they said that they could not explain this data because, after all, what could an analyzer crystal outside and down the stream from the interferometer, what could that do to the interference upstream? It couldn't do anything logically, and yet, in fact, it had a huge impact. It robustly restored the interference. So they said that quantum mechanics could not explain this, and they invoked something called Wheeler's Smoky Dragon to explain why they could not explain this data. I say that if an analyzer crystal inserted uh, outside the interferometer, uh, if its presence or absence determines the presence or absence of wave interference, as you can see in this the yellow part of this graph, uh, the center uh, shows no analyzer crystal and there is no wave interference. The right-hand side shows the presence of an analyzer crystal and robust wave interference, tall sine waves. If an analyzer crystal, uh, present or absent, determines the presence or absence of uh, interference inside an interferometer, then the analyzer crystal must be upstream from the waves. The waves must be going first through the analyzer crystal and then through the interferometer, which means that there are zero energy waves going from the detector backwards through the interferometer and the neutrons are following the waves downstream. Now, I've looked a lot at these data from this particular study, and it, I can assure you that um, there's no other way to explain this. This experiment clearly shows that there are waves going in both directions. So this experiment is one of the ones I'm referring to as the mountain of experimental evidence that demonstrates that our model is true. There are waves going in both directions. This is our basic machine uh, from the person's eye uh, or detector comes a elementary wave, a zero energy plane wave, which we call an elementary wave. And there you have the wave equation, psi L equals E to the I K X plus omega T. If you were to try to develop that wave equation into a full blown Schrodinger equation, as I'm about to do for a different equation in a moment, you would find you could not do it because the plus sign in, the, in this plane wave going to the left, the plus sign will not allow you to develop a, a Schrodinger wave. The math comes out wrong. So our wave goes over and it strikes point our particle alpha at a time when alpha is in a mood to be reflective rather than transparent. Particle alpha reflects that same wave, which then becomes the same wave going towards the eye, going towards the right. It's the pink uh, wave at the bottom. Psi r equals e to the i k x minus omega t. So how on earth can we justify that a plane wave, just because it uh, reflected, is going to blossom into uh, a Schrodinger wave, as if the plane wave took anabolic steroids. Well, it's rather simple math, and you know, it's easy to imagine it happening, because we're not adding any energy or anything special to the wave in order to make it into a Sch Schrodinger wave, which it has to be if it, if it is going to pick up and carry uh, that particle, a gamma or alpha, either one, back to the eye. Let's interrupt for a second to mention that Erwin Schrodinger did not believe in the existence of physical particles. He thought they could be replaced by uh, wave packets. We don't agree. We think that the physical particle might be carried by a wave packet, but they are, waves and particles are different. Wave-particle duality is wrong. Another thing to be said about particles, 
uh, by way of a aside, is that John von Neumann, a brilliant mathematician, asked a obvious question that no one knew how to answer. He said, the Schrodinger equation is a deterministic equation, so how did the randomness get into quantum mechanics? No one could answer that. Uh, we do have an answer, which is that the randomness comes from the particle. The particle is at random on a haphazard basis, making a decision whether to be transparent or reflect each of the incoming waves. Now let's go back to the development of our equations. This is how we do it. We take the second derivative of our wave function and we get partial squared psi r over partial x squared and then that gives us i k squared psi r and that's minus k squared psi r. Now k uh, is equal to momentum divided by h bar and when we plug in the variables, what we get is that the second derivative of psi r equals momentum squared over h bar squared times psi r, which gives us h bar squared partial squared psi r over partial x squared equals momentum squared psi r, which we are going to call 17, equation 17, because that's what I called it in the article associated with this video. We also know that energy equals one half mv squared plus u, where u is the potential energy. And if we multiply our energy equation by psi r, we get this. And then if we plug in equation 17 into the energy equation just mentioned, we get the time independent Schrodinger equation very easily uh, derived. To get the time dependent Schrodinger equation we take the first derivative uh, with respect to time of our wave function psi r. Now we define energy equals h bar omega. When we multiply both sides of that equation by psi r uh, we get the following equations and when we plug that into the time independent Schrodinger equation we arrive at this which is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So like Gödel and Turing we have tried to develop a simple game or machine to explain our ideas and it consists of this picture here where a plane wave of zero energy goes out from the detector uh, reflects off particle alpha and as it goes in the opposite direction back towards the eye and we said that that reflection causes the wave function to blossom into a Schrodinger wave. Now we've just gone through some mathematical equations to explain how a plane wave can easily blossom into a time dependent Schrodinger wave without changing its status as a zero energy wave. Now there's something very important to be said here. In our model or in our game or machine every Schrodinger wave had a prehistory before the particle was emitted, before it started to move. That which we call a Schrodinger wave had a prehistory. It existed in a childhood and adolescence before the time when we know it as an adult Schrodinger wave. It was previously starting at the detector and it was called a plane wave and it was going in a different direction. So that puts things in a different perspective. So our Schrodinger wave is enfolded in a different context. If you stand back and don't look at the immediate details of what's going on, it you could think that plane waves of zero energy go out from detectors and particles follow those waves backwards. That's not in detail what happens, but that's sort of a blunt or crude a summary of what appears to happen. A prominent part of our model is this blue plane wave uh, of zero energy going out from the eye. Now 
of all the things in our game, that's one of the most controversial, one of the ones that people have most trouble understanding, in part because a lot of folks don't like the idea of zero energy waves, but also because of the implications that if an a arrow like that is coming out of a detector, uh, it implies that arrows like that are coming out of the walls beside you. It's like nature is filled with these blue arrows all over the place. So the question is, I mean, is it realistic? Well, this is a game. And, you know, games don't have to be realistic. I mean, for example, in chess, who says that a knight should go two squares forward and one square sideways? That's just the rule of the game. But we've also hinted that this game that we're, we've invented and are presenting to you has some relationship with reality. I mean, after all, we've shown both in the Purcell effect and in the case of the neutron interferometer experiment, we've shown uh, that there is evidence of such blue plane waves going out from detectors and carrying zero energy and particles following those waves backwards. So am I saying that this is reality? This is how nature works? Well, I mean, to show that, we would have to explain a really difficult experiment, such as the double slit experiment. But our model, our game, is not real is not reality. I mean, last time I checked, reality had more than one dimension and more than one particle. Let us now discuss the double slit experiment, uh, which is perhaps the most well-known quantum experiment, and one which, according to Richard Feynman, the quantum mechanics does not know how to explain. Feynman said the double slit experiment contains the central mystery of quantum mechanics. Uh, our machine or game does know how to solve this uh, double slit experiment. Here is how we apply our game or machine to the double slit experiment. The detector is called the target screen, is on the right, and particle alpha is on the left inside the particle gun. And in the middle, in between them, there's a barrier with two slits, as you know. From any point, such as point Z on the target screen, elementary waves, which are the blue arrows, go forth uh, in these arcs. And then they go through, backwards through the two slits, A and B. And on in proximity to the particle gun, the ones through A interfere with the ones through B. So in our model, all wave interference is near the particle gun. No wave interference is near the target screen. So as the waves from point uh, Z on uh, the, the target screen impinge on point alpha, uh, they interfere with each other, and that interference affects the uh, amplitude with which a given wave from a given point on the target screen impinges on, on the particle gun. Now, we've only shown waves emanating from one point, Z, but all the different points, a zillion different points on the target screen are similarly putting forth elementary waves which are arriving at the particle gun with various intensities. The waves from point Z do not interact with, do not add together with, do not interfere with waves from other points on the target screen. So although we call these plane waves, there are no waves crossing the space as a train of vertical lines moving right to left. We need to clarify this confusing point. There are two meanings to the term superposition additivity. What we're dealing with is called a plane wave equation and it is a solution to a partial differential equation that is linear. And therefore, if we have two different solutions to that linear differential equation, we can add them together and that also will be a solution. However, we're referring there only to one equation and each point on the target screen 
has a different and unique plane wave equation attached to it. Thus, we cannot add waves from point Z1 to waves from point Z2 or Z3 or Zn because they all have separate individual wave equations and therefore there are no trains of parallel planes marching across the space. Now, let's turn our attention to particle alpha inside the particle gun. Wave function collapse occurs when the particle is emitted from the gun in response to following backwards one particular incoming elementary wave. You should notice that after the particle leaves the gun, there is no further wave interference. It has become a deterministic and is no longer a probabilistic experiment. The particle follows its trajectory with a probability of 1. The trajectory is exactly the opposite of the trajectory used by the incoming elementary wave from point Z. The particle goes through only one of the two slits, and it doesn't matter which slit, and inevitably makes a dot at point Z from which its particular elementary wave originated. A moment ago I said that waves from point Z do not add together with waves from other points on the target screen, so they do not form a train of vertical line waves crossing the space from right to left. The reason that's important is because waves from point Z, if they happen to be the one that triggers the response of particle alpha, alpha will make a dot at point Z and not at some other point. In making this video, we have used such wave equations as are available, but they are not really capable of be doing justice to the elementary wave world because if I am an elementary wave, central to my identity is the fact that I am destined to strike point Z in the future, and I cannot join forces with other elementary waves around me whose destiny is to target other points, not point Z, in the future. I have no idea how to symbolize the word destiny in mathematical variables or functions. Much has been written about complementarity meaning that we see a wave pattern on the target screen only if we do not know which slit a particle used. We claim that complementarity is caused by the equipment and not caused by human consciousness. In order to know which slit is used, we have to introduce a tiny lamp and detector inside the experiment. Let's say that it's a lamp that emits a infinitesimal amount of energy. The infinitesimal amount of energy from the lamp poisons the elementary waves which carry zero energy, poisons those waves as they pass backwards through the two slits so that the elementary waves lose their superposition additivity. By this we mean that the waves forget that they were born at point Z and the one coming through slit A thinks it was born at slit A, and the one through slit B thinks it was born at slit B. Therefore, there is no wave interference, for the obvious reasons. Now, the wave pattern on a target screen, what does it mean? That wave pattern is a picture of the wave interference of elementary waves impinging on the particle gun. But we just said that if there's a lamp in the experiment, there is no wave interference, and therefore the final pattern on the target screen will show no wave interference. As we turn the little lamp off and on and off and on, notice what happens to the wave interference impinging on the particle gun and what happens to the pattern on the target screen. This explains complementarity. Now, let's design an experiment that no one has done. A variation on the double slit experiment. This is an experiment for which quantum mechanics and 
TEW, our system, predict different outcomes. And so you can, if you were an experimenter, which is not me, and you wanted to conduct this experiment, you could get a yes-no answer as to which theory is correct. We're going to use a regular old double slit experiment with particles fired one at a time from the particle gun. Above one of the slits, say the slit to the right, we're going to put a large powerful laser that has the capability of firing and closing off the right hand slit. So as long as a particle has not yet fired, both slits are open or patent. As soon as a particle is fired from the gun, the laser will close the right-hand slit and leave open the left-hand slit. According to quantum mechanics, this then would be a one-slit experiment and there would be no particular wave pattern on the target screen. But according to uh, our theory, TEW, all wave interference precedes the firing of the particle gun. And therefore, by the time the laser closes the right slit, already all wave interference is finished. And therefore, what you will find on the target screen is, is the pattern inscribed by that wave interference, but only the left-hand side of the picture. Now we're going to define and build a second game or machine. This is going to be called Advanced Elementary Wave Game. It's based on boundary conditions of a domain named Omega Prime, which we define as a one-dimensional domain stretching from Alice on the left to a detector named Bob on the right. Over that domain, we will define a bi-ray, which is the red and blue arrow you see. I'll talk about that in a moment. The boundary condition for domain Omega Prime is the following. The probability of a photon following a bi-ray is the amplitude of it following one ray times the amplitude of it following the countervailing ray. What do we mean by these red and blue arrows that constitute the bi-ray? In the first game, or machine, we defined elementary waves, and we implied that everywhere in space there are an infinite number of these zero-energy waves traveling at the speed of light in all directions and at all wavelengths. That means that every elementary ray has a partner moving coaxially, right on top of each other, in opposite directions. We define a bi-ray as that combination of two countervailing elementary rays of the same wavelength. In a bi-ray, what makes the two rays coherent is the photons that are following them. You can think of a photon as being like a locomotive, the locomotive is running on both tracks. The experiment has two locomotives starting in about the center and the engines are going in opposite directions, one toward Alice, one towards Bob. The engines or locomotives or photons provide all the energy. The track is passive, it provides no energy. So that explains the red and blue arrows crossing domain omega prime in our second game. In this game, we are going to emphasize the polarization of the bi waves because both Alice and Bob are looking to see whether they do or do not observe a photon coming through a polarizer. In the center of this game, we are going to emit an entangled pair of photons, one traveling to the left towards Alice, the other traveling towards Bob. You'll notice that the bi waves have been there for a long time, but are communicating no information from Alice to Bob or back. Now, when an entangled pair of photons are emitted, if Alice is looking for a photon, through her equipment at random angles, phi 1, and that angle changes from moment to moment, 
and Bob is looking through his polarizer at random angles phi 2, then the probability or coincidence rate of them both seeing a photon simultaneously is cosine squared phi 2 minus phi 1. At no point did Alice send any signal to Bob, nor vice versa. Neither knew anything about the other one's photon. If you change the way the photons are emitted by a source, then you can change the coincidence rate from the cosine squared to sine squared phi 2 minus phi 1. The equations are available in the article that we will cite at the end of this video. Alice and Bob always violate Bell's inequality. Our only assumption is the boundary condition. If a locomotive represents a photon, the only boundary condition is that the probability of a locomotive following a railroad track is the amplitude of it following the blue rail times the amplitude of it following the red rail. That is the only assumption we need in order to reproduce the Bell test experimental results. So our results always violate Bell's inequality, violate Einstein's assumptions, but they also differ from quantum mechanics, especially with respect to speed of light and non-locality. At no point do we violate the speed of light because our stopwatch in elementary wave theory always starts sooner than the particle was emitted. So where on earth did this theory of elementary waves and these boundary condition games come from? Most viewers have never heard of this before. Well, it comes not from an academic center, but from a couple of guys way out in the perimeter, uh, off the horizon. Our story starts with some kids sitting on the living room floor of Grandma Beach's house for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And my cousin, Louis Little, who's always been the most brilliant and the most argumentative person I ever met, and I, having discussions about three-dimensional and four-dimensional and five-dimensional tic-tac-toe. Over the years, Lewis has had a huge impact on my life. He advised me to go to Brown University to study mathematics, which I did. He had been a physics major there. As he grew up, he continued to be the most brilliant and the most argumentative person I ever met. And he began to say that, quote, either I'm crazy or quantum mechanics is crazy, unquote. Uh, after quite a few years, he went to graduate school and he arrived at the conclusion that it was quantum mechanics that was crazy. I tried to remind him that it could be both. Over the years, he and I went our separate ways. He got a PhD in physics and then spent his career investing in commodities on Wall Street. An awful lot of people with PhDs in physics are investing on Wall Street. The direction of my life took me all over the place. I got diplomas from Harvard University, Yale University, Brown University, and Case Western Reserve Universities, and I became a Episcopal minister or priest. Then I went to medical school and became an MD physician and then an epidemiologist and was on the faculty of the National Institutes of Health. And by the time Lewis and I connected again, I was working in a hospital uh, as a psychiatrist, taking care of indigent poor people who with schizophrenia and suicidality and drug abuse the story picks up again in the year 2000 when my Aunt Marge, Louis Little's stepmother, had an 80th birthday party and it was there that Louis and I got to talking again and he explained to me that for the past 30 years he had been isolated all alone on weekends and nights working on trying to solve the problem of understanding the starting assumptions of quantum mechanics. He, he didn't talk to anybody during that old time. He kept reading physics and thinking 
and coming up with nothing for a long time until 1993 when it suddenly dawned on him, well, you know, maybe quantum particles and quantum waves go in opposite directions. And that was an aha moment for him. And he thought he had the, the keys to understanding quantum mechanics. But the scholarly world, the academic world, had zero interest. He wrote up his findings, uh, was rejected by a long succession of leading journals, and finally got his ideas published in Physics Essays in 1996. Uh, he was invited to speak at the Jet Propulsion Labs at Caltech. But after that, uh, the scholarly and academic world continued to have zero interest. He explained his theory to me, and I was fascinated. I thought, Cheapers, he's really come up with something. It was very exciting. In the year 2009, he sent me a book that he had written, and I thought it was a very angry book. The first paragraph denounced physics and physicists as fools, and I thought, this is a big mistake. You can't market an idea by attacking the audience you're trying to reach. So I got involved with him trying to market his ideas to physicists. I joined the American Physical Society. Uh, I went to their uh, conventions, dragged him along. Uh, four times a year I would make scholarly presentations about the theory of elementary waves, and from those presentations I learned how the physicists uh, responded to this, what they were thinking. In the meantime, I was reading a huge amount of physics uh, experimental evidence. Because I have such a background in the sciences, I figured I at least understand what empirical evidence says, and I began publishing articles. Since that time, I've published two dozen articles as the sole author in peer-reviewed journals of physics, chemistry, and mathematics, and I've discovered there is a huge mountain of evidence that supports Lewis Little's idea. So what do the experts think about this mountain of evidence? Well, they won't think about it. They won't read any of that vast number of experiments that contradict wave-particle duality. Physics experts are not hostile to TEW. They're simply mute. My cousin's idea was basically metaphysical. There are zero energy elementary waves, and particles follow those waves backwards. I discovered that the scholarly world can't stand metaphysics. They treat it as an obscenity. So I said to him one day, look, you know, to get your idea out there, it needs a mathematics. And he said to me, yeah, look, Jeff, you have the degree in mathematics. It is your assignment to build that mathematics. Well, my goodness, I just did not think I could do it. I had the opinion, uh, incorrectly, I think, that nothing had ever been discovered by anyone, any mathematician over the age of 30. And, uh, you know, right now when I make this video, I'm age 77. My brain is very rusty. I did not think I could do it, but I spent 10 years working on it. If you really want to feel stupid, try working on a problem that Einstein could not solve. After stumbling around in the dark for years and years, finally the light bulb went on in my head and I thought, you know, if we're talking about elementary waves, then duh, we need a wave equation. But then I thought, it's just contrary to the nature of wave equations to think of a particle following a wave backwards. I'm never going to find such an equation as that. So then I thought, TEW must be false. I mean, you can't have a wave without a wave equation. I know there's a huge mountain of experimental evidence that supports TEW, but I thought, you know, maybe somehow the experimental evidence is wrong. I just can't figure out, I'm just not bright enough to figure out the, the wave equation we need for the waves going in one direction and particles in the opposite direction. But then my wife, as she has repeatedly, 
urged me to go back and tackle TEW again, first because she knows it is my calling, but more important because she believes that pushing my brain beyond what it is capable of will prevent cognitive decline. Besides, Einstein said that imagination is more important than intelligence, and while I have a dwindling intelligence, my imagination remains rich. So, that's when and why I conjured up the games that are presented in this video. And the advantage is, when I'm inspired by Godel and Turing, that these are games. So my critics won't be able to say, Well, you're wrong about the real world. Because I'm not talking about the real world. I'm only talking about games inside my imagination in which I get to declare what are the laws of nature? What are the rules? So that's where this video comes from. I think the most important thing in this video is that we have defined quantum weirdness as a mathematical problem. That's never been clear before. For a century, some of the greatest geniuses of all time have been working on this problem and have not even managed to come up with a coherent vocabulary for discussing anything. If it is defined as a mathematical problem, then I think it ranks right up there with Riemann's hypothesis. Now I'm going to present you with a third game. This one's called the quantum mechanics game. Uh, here's how it works. The detector looks at particle alpha. There is no blue arrow going out from the human eye. Particle alpha, when it wants to, sends itself or some representative like a photon by means of a Schrodinger wave over into the human eye. So that's the way the world works, according to this game. Using the quantum mechanics game, we're going to ask you five questions. Number one, can you explain why particles act different if we're watching them than if we close our eyes? Answer, no. Number two, can you explain the Schrodinger's cat paradox? No. TEW, by the way, can explain that based on the fact that wave function collapse occurs before an observation or measurement is made. Number three, can you explain the Purcell effect? Answer, yes. Number four, can you explain the double slit experiment? No. Number five, can you explain the Bell test experimental results? Well, yes, but there's a lot of funny stuff. Like a lot of people think that everything that goes on here on Earth is immediately affected by what goes on on the other side of the Milky Way galaxy 106,000 light years away. We'll give you half a point for that. As I mentioned, the technical content of this video uh, has been published in June 2021 in a scholarly peer-reviewed mathematics journal. And here is the reference. If you type that DOI into your web browser, the article should open free of charge. So thank you very much for your attention.